Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through various RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through two supplemental books for Shadow Dark, Unnatural Selection and Into the Shadowlands. These two PDFs, uh, I, I'm going to be getting the physical copy of Unnatural Selection. I backed the, the uh, Kickstarter and, and this is, you know, just came, I think, a couple days before Christmas, this PDF. So it's, it's really brand new. I'm not sure it's available to everybody yet, but it will be. Uh, but Into the Shadowlands is. You can get that on Drive Through RPG. These are both really good supplements for Shadow Dark. They, they basically add a lot of additional material that will broaden the options that your players will have. As far as I can tell, not in a game-breaking way or in an unbalancing way, but certainly in a way that will make your table feel more like 5th edition if you just open up all of these supplements to your players. Uh, now, you know, some players are some tables, that's immediately a non-starter for some tables. Like, nope, no thanks, I don't want this table to feel like 5th edition. But, you know, before you just say nope, <laughs> you know, follow through the video and see if this material is, at least some of it would, would, would appeal to you because there's a lot of stuff in these two PDFs. This first one, Unnatural Selection, is 159 pages. The second one, Into the Shadowlands, is over 50 pages of 52, I think. And so you get a lot of material in those pages. And so sometimes... Uh, you, know, you might not add all of it into your game, but some of it, some of the optional rules, some of the special classes, really cool stuff, and they're thematically strong. So you, maybe you wouldn't add them all into a campaign, but you might add some of them into a campaign. And so I think that is, is why you would, uh, you might want to get these books, because there's, they're toolkits that allow you to kind of pick and choose what you would want to add into your game. And as I said, I don't think mechanically they're going to break anything. But flavor and in tone, they are certainly options that are available to players in 5e. They sort of feel like that. You'll see, like, we're going to get turtle folk and tieflings and things like that. And, uh, or tieflings. I'd say tiefling, but I think some people say tiefling. I used to say tiefling. But that's going to appeal to, I think, Shadow Dark's prime audience, which is old 5e players, right? I mean, I think that in my Shadow Dark deep dive, I mentioned this, that I think the, the primary target for Shadow Dark were players who are in 5e but who are getting tired of it and want to move on to something more challenging, more old school, more dungeon crawly. And these books don't break that at all, but they do, I think, help to ease the transition from 5e. I think that's the whole point of them, or at least that's the whole point of Unnatural Selection. Maybe not the whole point, but it's one of the major, major uh, factors here. So anyway, I'm going to go through it uh, and uh, just, you know, give you my, my thoughts as we go through, as I usually do. Uh, it's pretty standard formatting here. It's not uh, hyperlinked the way that uh, the other one is, but Unnatural Selection is uh, really just... It, it fits in with Shadow Dark entirely in terms of its tone and in terms of its presentation. Sorry, the tone of its presentation. It, it feels like a, a... I don't know, you might say like a, an official supplement. Um, great pieces of art throughout that fit in with the Shadow Dark art that you see in the book. Now, this one is hyperlinked. The table of contents is hyperlinked. So the art page isn't, but the, but the actual table of contents is. And you get a sense of what you're going to get. So you get tons of character options, 35 pages of character options. Uh, and then you get 40 pages of magic. Then, you, uh, then you're going to get uh, a few pages of gameplay options. Uh, lots of monsters, nine pages of monsters, which is great. Or more than nine pages, excuse me, uh, from page 88 all the way down to page 134. So quite a few pages, 50, 50 pages or so of, um, of monsters, which is awesome. That's a huge feature that this book has. And then you get some magic items, 10 pages of magic items. And then you get Lottery of the Lost, which is a, an adventure, which is up here. And if you, uh, I, in the Kickstarter I backed, I got a, a few kind of two-page adventures as well. Uh, four, I think, four extra two or three pages, maybe three. Uh, two-page adventures, which I haven't looked through in detail, but they're just two pages. It's very similar to the official adventures that are, are released from the Arcane Library. All right, so we got a good piece of, uh, uh, again, thematic, f thematically fitting uh, flavor art, or flavor text here at the beginning. It's thematic because it, it's very like the, the introduction in the Shadow Dark book. So art there for the tiefling, and then your characters page. All right, here's, here's your different ancestries that you get. The Chelonian, the Turtle People, the Dragonborn, the Forest Elf, the Half-Troll, the Shadow Elf, the Tiefling, the Gnome, the Mycelian, the Risen, and the Slime Folk. Okay, so now you'll notice this is divided into Ancestry and Bonus Ancestry. I think that just really refers to the Kickstarter tiers. The first of uh, this page was just kind of added in. 
but the uh, the first two pages were the official ones that were in the you know they were just going to be in the book regardless. And then because it reached its tier, its different Kickstarter tiers, uh, gnomes, mycelans, risen, and slime folk were added in. Oh, and then Skurid and Silvarans as well. So you've got a whole bunch of extra races. You're looking at twelve extra, right? Twelve extra races that are going to be added in, or ancestors are going to be added in, and they are they run the the, the gamut, right? <laughs> From rat folk, uh, botanical beings with leaves, resurrected heroes, slime folk, mycelans, gnomes. You get the point. Now, again, are you going to use all of these in any game? Well, if you do, you're going to definitely have a table that feels more like 5e. You're going to have much more, um, you know, you could run a Forgotten Realms campaign and use all these races and they'd fit right in. Uh, but mo more likely, right, you're going to pick the ones that you like and add those into a campaign. You know, the way that you... I think you could do with any any book of, of races and things like that. These are cool, and again, they don't seem broken, but they do seem pretty good, and I think some of these are fun. It would be fun to play. Slime form is pretty cool from the slime folk. Uh, would I allow all of these at my table? Probably not, but I think uh, I know that some of my 5e players would really like to play Dragonborn <laughs> or uh, Mycelans, maybe, or Skurids. I think, that's especially with this piece of art here, I think one of my players who's younger would look at this and go, oh, I want to play a skirt, a rat folk. Then you get the new classes, and I think these are really the highlight of the character options here because I really like these char these these, these uh, classes. You get the Beastmaster class, which is sort of a transforming kind of creature. Uh, you transform into a humanoid form or into a beast form. You can shift back and forth. It's kind of interesting. Um... You get the Fiend class, which is sort of like, I guess, a, a Flame Warlock. It's one way of putting it from, from 5th edition. Firebond weapons and pyromancy. Uh, and you get some talents here, and they're really interesting. You get the D12 for... Uh, what do you call them? Talents, yeah. Excuse me, I, could, I was looking at the word talents. You get a D12 instead of 2D6, so it's totally random here what you're going to get. The Grave Warden is a really cool one. Now, I had access to this because I had kickstarted it. This was one of the previews. I had access to the Grave Warden, and I opt offered it as a, as a class option for Curse of Strahd. No one picked it, but I offered it. This is essentially like a Reaper. You're using scythes and daggers, and you're casting Grave Warden spells, and you're claiming undead. Basically, you're taking control of undead and, and making them do your bidding. It's a really cool idea. And there's a whole list of Grave Warden spells that you can learn. They're specific. There's the Ovate, which is Custodians of Nature's Balance. Seems like a druid or something like that. Um, and then the Plague Doctor. This was another one that I had access to, and I added it in. Again, no one picked it, but someone, one of my players came very close to picking it. Shadow Veiled Alchemical Apothecaries. These guys are really cool. I like the Plague Doctor quite a bit. Uh, it would fit right in with certain kinds of campaigns. As I said, like in Curse of Strahd, the way I was running it, it would have worked perfectly. Um, I'm kind of sad that no one picked it. <laughs> you have Mesmerize Insect. That's kind of funny. Uh, you have a mask infusion, and you have elixirs, and basically you can use them, and they do special things, kind of like, kind of like rangers from Shadow Dark. And I realized, you know, I didn't cover the Shadow Dark ranger or bard, which are technically official, or sort of official, but they're not in the prime book. They're second secondary uh, material that's been added in. They might be in the print version. I'm not sure, but they're not in the PDF. Then you get the shaman or the shaman indispensable medicine men and oracles serve as healers, guardians of ancient wisdom, and conduits between the tangible and ethereal realms. And there's a picture at the bottom, which is a troll shaman. <laughs> That's just straight up from, you know, uh, World of Warcraft. Troll shaman. Then you get a whole bunch of new backgrounds, and they're divided into different categories. You get untamed backgrounds, underworld backgrounds. Uh, and the, that would be sort of to be um, contrasted with the initial 20 backgrounds from Shadowdark. You could add those in you could say, you know, roll a d3 to see which background table you're rolling and then roll on. Or you could just be like, okay, if you're, you know, we're playing this kind of campaign, so we're going to play an underworld campaign, so here's your underworld table. Or you could mix and match to fit your own campaign, which I'd probably do. Get nature spirits, which are going to make more sense with the shamans, right? That you get, uh, basically it's a list of new gods, but they're nature spirits rather than, than gods directly. But they are divided into the different... Uh, uh, alignments, as you might expect. Now there's a death, death pantheon, and I really like some of these. The Morthrax is a great chaotic evil and god. I'm going to use in campaigns into Morthrax also, and then Paradigm. Also, <clears throat> it's a really cool idea. A lawful god of death, the Arbiter Paradigm. I love it. 
So I would definitely use those. I think mean, all three are, all four are interesting, I should say. Dominus, New, uh, Lithia, Morthrax, and Paradigm. But I, they just, the names, first of all, are right in tone with old school gaming, I think. Um, but I think that the, that's just the, I like these ones a lot for, for some reason. <laughs> I like these ones a lot. Uh, creepy, creepy there. Titles, of course, you're going to get titles for each of the new classes. Beastmaster, Fiend, Grave Warden, Ovate, Plague Doctor, and Shaman. And a bunch of new rap uh, languages, including uh, Arachnid, um, Marsupial, Pachyderm, <laughs> Primate, Raptor. But of course, that means hawks and eagles and ostriches and things like that. So this would be more you know, animal languages, obviously, and additional common languages. Some gear, there's just some new gear options. Now, one of these is uh, the Rapier, which is a D6 finesse weapon. Uh, the Needle Whip, which is a D4 finesse weapon. The Hunting Knife, which is a D4 finesse weapon. The Sensor Flail, which is a D8 finesse weapon. Again, this is where you start to run into a little bit more risk because you're starting to get finesse weapons that are better or at least that are almost as good as some of the better uh, non-finesse weapons. I would be careful about implementing these simply because, again, of that balance between finesse and, or between dex and strength that Shadow Dark is trying to maintain. The dexterity is not meant to become a, a, you know, a replacement for strength as your main thing. So keep that in mind if you're going to implement these gear options. But they're cool gear options. And you could limit who's proficient with them, I suppose, and still make it balanced, perhaps. But the sensor flail has this gas uh, feature, which is really interesting. Some of them have the lash feature, which means you can make ranged attacks without leaving your hand. So there's an injectable with the needle whip and the stiletto, the darts, uh, and the rapier, which you can apply a poison to an elixir, uh, to this weapon and inject a target with a successful hit. Interesting and also potentially very powerful. You have a rapier with an injectable poison in it. You gotta be careful about that. Uh, character names, a bunch of untamed character names and underworld character names. Uh, so I think that's, that's cool. And they're divided into the different uh, ancestries you get in this book. A great piece of art there with magic. And this is a whole bunch of new spells here. You get Grave Warden magic, you get uh, drumming, which is the uh, shaman there and then there are rules for chanting raising the dead for the grave warden critical failure for the grave warden and then purging which is a sh shaman or an ovate sort of a cleric um, atonement grave warden mishaps perdition essence rupture flesh rot grasping hands great ideas here and then a whole bunch of spells for the grave warden and these are really cool uh, spells really cool spells and like they're gross grub geyser uh, summon Wraith, uh, Wall of Bones. Let's click on Wall of Bones and we'll take there because it's hyperlink. Wall of Bones, a tier four Grave Warden spare. Duration five rounds, range near. You summon a wall of writhing bones to rise from the ground. The one foot thick wall must be contiguous and can cover a near sized area in length and ten, and 10 feet tall or less. Foes close to the wall take 2d4 automatic damage per round from the grasping and clawing bony hands and claws. Each close section of the wall has AC 12 and 15 hit points. Really cool. Uh, it's, a, it's a great, um, flavorful, doesn't seem overpowered control spell. Uh, there's a whole bunch of spells like that. And again, I don't think any of them, as that I've seen, seem to be overpowered or break the system in any way. So they're very powerful, but that's true for Shadow Dark spells as well. And then you have gameplay options. So Ceremonies, which is a new way of gaining XP, sort of instead of downtime or carousing, you have this idea of doing Ceremonies. It makes more sense for, for the Shaman, basically. And then you get ceremonial outcome, which some things are pretty bad, and then some things are good. Curiosities. Uh, these are an interesting, uh, basically they're ways of generating random extra um, things you could run across in an adventure. Instead of just hazards or magic items or features, um, you can roll these strange things that you might run into. So for example, a fire pit made of shadow, right? Uh, this sort of feels much more like the maze rats tables of, uh, you know, uh, nouns and pro uh, adjectives and combining them in di for different materials and, and ethereal and uh, it reminds me of that. So you could roll an edifice, which is a bridge, and then you could roll the material and it's made of uh, ruby. And the characteristic is that it has a vibration as you cross. And when you interact with it, it uh, you must offer blood to interact with it, right? Or something like that. And the function here is to uh, gain polymorph others as a feature. Or it gives a blessing or gives a weapon. 
So there's a whole bunch of random tables you can roll on there that help add and interesting little features into your dungeon. New animals uh, for companions, because ovates get level zero companions, and then uh, where they can be found um, in uh, in the main book, in the Shadow Dark book, if they're if they're in that book rather than this one. You get a little uh, asterisk number next to it. So you get a whole bunch of new animals, um, natural animals, and uh, you know two 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 tables of those depending on the level. The fell curse. This is an uh, interesting idea here. What can happen to any living creatures can be cursed with the fell curse. And it gives them a list of what they, how you change. Your alignment changes, your deity changes, your morale changes, intelligence changes, mutations, all that stuff. And you get a mutation here. You get a menacing claw, or you become a brainiac, or you get an extra eye. Your skin deforms. Um, you, know, you get a weakness. You have powers and after effects, perhaps. So the fell curse is an interesting thing you could add into the game and, and really use it to change up your campaign. I would use it as like a campaign thing, right? There's, there's a source of the fell curse and it's spreading and it's doing these horrible things to animals. It'd be a really cool idea to do that. Right? Monster statistics, so you get a whole bunch of monsters, a lot of animals and, and other things. So ants, giant ants, giant ants, uh, queen, antelopes, uh, and a giant ape. Uh, flying apes, darksmith apes, flying apes, as I said. Yeah, oh, the Umbromancers, uh, Aranus the Cursed. It's another one of these, and a boss creature, it's a fell boss creature. And then you get you know, more animals here, but not just uh, not just uh, animals. You get some uh, plants and things like that. A blink dog, which was not in the previous game. Uh, dragon turtles. A dread hook. Uh, the dust monster. That's really creepy. Living dust that can shift forms and clog the lungs of its victims. That's really creepy. Uh, fell rack. Fell tra a fly trap. A giant fly trap. Cobblestone golems. A liquor golem. Tavern protector made of ale filled kegs with the head of a wine jug. <laughs> a gourd gun, which is a giant gourd. Kangaroos, koalas, creepers, Krumara the Troll Queen. It's a great, great idea there with a bunch of special powers. Um, mountain lions, meerkats, giant mantises, possums, pelicans, puddle reapers. <laughs> lots and lots of animals here, which is great. Again, more creatures, more stat blocks, always great to have. Uh, that's a great piece of art for a very creepy monster. Vine Wraith, the Wall Creeper, the Withering Stalker, and then the end of the monster section. But then you move right into treasure. These are particular magic items that you can get. Bear Claw, the Beastmaster, Bracers of the Werewolf, uh, Kromara's Silver Scepter. Benefit none. If the bearer of the Ghost Scepter acquires the Silver Scepter, the two merge, retaining the Ghost Scepter's qualities and gaining the ability to magically open a mundane lock once per day. That's really, really interesting. So you need the Ghost Scepter and the Silver Scepter, but if you get them both, you can open mundane locks once per day. That's really cool. Snake oil. <laughs> That's awesome. Trumpet of the Ghoul. And a bunch of dudes getting ripped apart. Lottery of the Lost, a level zero gauntlet adventure for Shadow Dark. That's what the adventure in the back is. I'm not going to go through it. Um, I haven't looked into it actually in too much detail, but level zero gauntlets are great to have because even if they're broken or overpowered, you just run them as a one shot, right? If, if, even if you get crazy items by the end or they're really hard, either way, gauntlets are gauntlets and they're meant to be kind of, you know, weird and gonzo and, and crazy and fun. So I think almost regardless of how it is, the fact that it's, you know, uh, level zero gauntlet will probably mean that it's it's going to be fun. <laughs> but again, I haven't looked at it, so I can't really give that. Review. I haven't looked at it in detail. Um, but I don't want to go through it here. Uh, so anyway, that is Unnatural Selection. By the way, that last adventure is about 13 pages. So Unnatural Selection. As you can see, it's definitely expanding the options for players, but it also expands your toolkit. It gives you monsters and some spells that you're, you can have. And, and gives you, you know, I think, a lot more material to easily add stuff into a campaign without doing a lot of homebrew. Now, Shadow Dark is pretty easy to homebrew for, so to develop your own classes that fit with the tone of the campaign you're developing, to develop your own ancestries, uh, isn't too difficult. But you can use these as templates, and uh, or just you know, bring them in whole cloth if they fit closely enough. And, uh, and, and then again, the presentation of the book is great, and 
the options will appeal certainly to 5e players. So is this book as much of a home run as Shadow Dark itself? No, it's, it's supplemental, right? It's obviously supplemental, and it doesn't appeal to me quite as much as the tone of the original, simply because I'm kind of tired of the 5e play dragon people kind of game. But that is going to appeal to a lot of players, and so if you feel that your table just needs a little extra push to get into it, or if your table would really enjoy this, then I would highly recommend this book. Now, Into the Shadowlands, which is the second one that I wanted to cover, it's by House DM. Um, it is certainly smaller in its scope, in its tone, and in what it's doing. Uh, but it, it has a few optional rules that I really like. This one focuses much more on classes uh, rather than ancestries. In fact, that's what it entirely has. And there's a little bit of, of uh, double dipping here in terms of it does some of the same things that the unnatural selection does. This is much more obviously trying to appeal to 5e players directly uh, because of the names of the classes are pretty much just the names of the classes. <laughs> but you get things like the Apothecary uh, with a bunch of concoctions, which is very similar to the Plague Doctor, but it's different enough that you could include them both. But they are similar in, in what they're doing, right? Uh, there's the Assassin, which is sort of like a hyper thief. Um, so, you know, just more of that... Uh, Rather than getting sneak attack, you get this assassinate feature. So rather or backstab, rather than getting backstab, you get sneak attack, assassinate. Um, is it necessary? Um, I don't think so. <laughs> I think this is really stepping on the toes of the thief in a really, really sloppy way. I don't see why you would do this, but you know, hey, you, 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 if you think an assassin fits more with the th tone than a thief, then just do that in. You get a barbarian which is basically 5e Barbarian, just, you know, moved into Shadow Dark terms and reduced in its power level and all that. Uh, you get the Druid, which is similar to uh, the, um, similar to the Ovate in a lot of what it's doing. Um, you get Druid spells in this book. You get Knights, Armor Mastery, Martial Adept. You get a Mount, Knighthood, which is sort of like something you have to, uh, you know, um, the title really does matter for a knight, I guess. <laughs> and that can, and you get common mounts here, which is also a good a good thing to have. You get some stats for, for common and uncommon mounts. The paladin, which is, again, sort of a mix of fighter, a little weaker bit of a fighter with a little bit of cleric in there and um, some extra powers like smite and lay on hands. And then you get the ranger, which is, uh, again, really stepping on the toes of the ranger from Shadow Dark, <laughs> right? Um, so, but it does similar things, and I'm, I'm not, you could pick the one you wanted, right? Then you get the Sorcerer, which is uh, sort of a, you know, again, moving D&D 5e Sorcerers into Shadow Dark with Sorcery Points and all that thing. You get Mana Points instead of Sorcery Points, and then, a, and then the Warlock, um, which, again, maybe treads on the toes of the Cursed Knight from Cursed Scroll 1 or the Infernal um, Keeper, or I forget the, the, the class from a natural selection. But uh, you could add it in if you preferred it with different packs that you can, can choose. Pack of Boons, uh, Pack of Mastery. You get Druid Spells, which are taken very much from 5e, but, you know, again, reworked to Shadow Dark um, with a whole bunch of different spells. And uh, I'm just going to jump to the end here again. Uh, this one is not hyperlinked, so you have to actually just click through them here which is not a huge problem. There's not that many of them. We get Witch Bolt, right? Um, which is like Witch Bolt from 5e, but instead it's a d4 damage instead of a d10. Um, and if the creature moves far, the, the beam breaks and the spell ends. So in that sense, it's just like Shadow Dark. Or it's just like 5e. Um, wild Form, Wind Walk, Water Breathing. You get Advanced Spellcasting. Uh, these are just rules for changing your, your spellcasting a bit. Um, if you roll natural 20, you can double the dice, double the targets, double the duration, or recover one of your failed spells. Just a way of doing this if you want. Uh, arcane mishaps. Um, you gain one corruption. Uh, corruption is a new feature that you can add here. Um, Manolith, which is an arcane monolith. <laughs> Burning spells, you can decide to, to skip. But again, these are optional rules you would add in, right? Druids, priests, and warlocks can change their spells after a rest. Burning spells, you can choose any any caster can choose to automatically succeed a spell instead of rolling for it, but then they can't cast it again until they make a check. Uh, blood magic is an option where you burn down your own points, gain corruption, and uh, and cast the spell at a bonus. 
mishap tables, the devastation tables, um, depending on if you get enough corruption to get devastations and things like that. Uh, additional rules are temporary hit points, armor type, new weapons and helms, uh, new weapon armor types there. With equipment exhaustion, luck tokens, default class buffs. Um, in the PDF, it says oh, I'm still playtesting these new classes. Here are some minor adjustments to keep them in a, uh, make to assist in keeping them viable choices. In other words, <laughs> right, these are stronger than the initial classes. So what you're looking at here is power creep. So I think unnatural selection is much more careful in what it's doing. Into the Shadowlands seems like here is really, here's a bunch of middle bridges to 5e, and it's definitely moving towards 5e in terms of its power level. I mean, it's obviously still within the Shadow Dark power level, but you're talking about here having to buff the base classes in order to keep them relevant. As soon as you start to do that sort of thing, I am less interested in, in what you're doing because it's like, okay, fine, that's okay. You know, this, and, and very much this might be, this might keep everything in balance, but um, this is moving in that direction of re-adding in all of the things that 5e is trying, <laughs> re-adding all the stuff that you were trying to get away from in Shadow Dark. And again, it's not necessarily a problem. If your table doesn't want the full Shadow Dark experience, you want to make it much more like 5e without a lot of the bloat, then you could you could take this into the Shadowlands and just add in most of these optional rules and extra classes and buff the base classes up and change some equipment options here, like gems are tiny, no longer take up a gear slot. Flint and steel is small, no longer takes up a gear slot. Little quality of life, in his view, uh, changes. So you could certainly do that. Um, but I think this is moving away from, from, you know, it's, it's moving back towards fifth edition in terms of its mechanics, not just in terms of its tones, moving back towards fifth edition. It doesn't get there. And I, I should make that absolutely clear. It, it doesn't, it doesn't not nearly get back to fifth edition, but it's moving in that direction. So that's what you'd be doing if you, if you buy this supplement and add it into your game. Um, a, a note on an initiative, some advice there about rolling initiative and an alternative initiative. Uh, and then corruption rules and, and, and what you what you get there as a result of corruption. Now, it's interesting that as you get corrupted, I do like this, this system quite a bit. As you get corruption, you actually do get some benefits. But if you ever reach 10 corruption, you fall under the control of the gym and become evil. So if you get to 7 to 9 points of corruption, you get plus 2 AC, plus 10 max hit points, plus 2 bonus on spell casting checks, or plus 2 on all attack and damage rolls. So maybe there's a reason to let that corruption build up. But if you get to 10, you're out. Uh, and then different diseases you can get, which are cool. I like them uh, with a little bit of quote, quote there at the end. And then a search the body table at the end of the book. Okay, so uh, of these two supplements, I think Into the Shadowlands is definitely not my favorite of the two. It, it, uh, it seems a little bit premature. Uh, it was released, I think really, you know, not that long ago, but certainly before the Shadow Dark book had been released fully. And so, like, the Ranger class, for example, the Assassin class, it, it just seems to kind of do what's already there and, and in a different way. So I'm not sure how cool that is to, like, hey, I mean, again, who, how cool, that's, that's the wrong way of putting it, how, um, how useful that is because you already have those things, basically. But a lot of the extra stuff you don't have. And obviously, these are two supplements on natural selection into the Shadowlands. So the fact that there's, you know, cross-pollination there or that there's overlap there, that's not anyone's fault. So just keep that in mind. If you're going to get both of these, then some of these features are going to be less useful. Okay, I'm gonna, am I going to have a Druid and an Ovate? Am I going to have a Warlock and a... Or am I going to have an Alchemist and a Plague Doctor? Am I going to have the Assassin and the Thief? But you're going to have to... You might pick and choose. But that would be true for any... Any classes or races you add into a game, you, you typically. <laughs> so I do think that they're both good, and I think that they're both going to appeal to people who want that more 5th edition flavor and tone at their Shadow Dark game. But uh, the one, Unnatural Selection, does it more with flavor and tone, and Into the Shadowlands does it more with mechanics. And I think that's worth keeping in mind. Anyway, I hope this has been interesting, and I'll see you guys in another video.